I'm Sharon Bill. Welcome to my YouTube channel. When you're playing a piece of music, I would suggest that it's really, really helpful to place that piece in context in social history because, well, one, it can be so enjoyable. Why not? Why not learn the most about it? It's really, really interesting. But also, oftentimes there are discrepancies or ambiguities in what we can do with, say, for example, the articulation or the dynamics of a piece of music. Oftentimes, these um, slur markings or dynamic markings are editorial. They're open to negotiation. And sometimes there are sort of bits that aren't quite clear. And so how would you know how to play that piece? And of course, it's always down to interpretation and perhaps the way one musician would play a piece is very different to the way another musician would play the piece and that's the beauty of music. I think it would be a very dull world if we all played the same piece of music exactly the same. And, you know, if we're playing quite old pieces, we've no recordings, we don't know exactly how Mozart wanted it played or Bach or Beethoven and so on. But we can have a good idea if we put the piece of music in context. You know, I'm no historian. And oftentimes, it, I find history fascinating, but I also find it quite annoying because it often raises far more questions than it answers. But there are some very general guidelines that are really, really helpful. For example, we talk about Baroque composers you know, like Bach and Handel. And they wouldn't have known they were called Baroque composers. They just composed at the time in history that they were composing in the style that was kind of prevalent at that time. And even when composers supposedly break the rules a little bit, it's always within the structure of that period. And in actual fact, the term Baroque would have been an insult given by later composers because it denoted the overly ornate textures of the music. And so, for example, if you think about, um, say, for example, let's compare it to the furniture styles of the time. If, for example, there was a chair leg, it would have been an ornately carved kind of vulture claw or lion claw with lots and lots of swirls and decoration. You know, if you think about a clock, you know, you know, you'd have a big gilt clock with lots of swirls and embellishments and lots and lots of detail. And I think that's very helpful when we compare, for example, say, the harpsichord music, which would necessarily have been very, very full of ornaments and trills because the instrument couldn't play a long note. And so the only way to keep a note going would to have lots of embellishments to keep the sound continuing. And the style of the music of that period would be one mood continuing throughout the whole piece, just keeps going and the same mood continues towards the end. And there would never have been any dynamic markings or there wouldn't have been much articulation suggestion. It was all down to the performer. But you can have a good idea that oftentimes, say for example in keyboard music, it would have been organ music, so there would have been terrace dynamics in steps and echo effects. Uh, because obviously you would just be changing manual as you play on different keyboards. Uh, so I think that helps us to understand what was going on. So we can put some crescendos and diminuendos because we've got the luxury to be able to do that on the piano now. And of course, if you were playing a wind instrument or a string instrument at the time, you would have had some dynamic sort of gradual changes, but it wouldn't have been great emotional surges. You know, that wouldn't have been appropriate compared to, for example, the Romantic period in the in the 1900s, where it was all set in the context of um, you know, this rebirth of learning and you know, psychoanalysis and storytelling and emotion. This is the time where composers and writers would have met together in the coffee shops. I don't know, it was quite that altruistic, but nevertheless, that went on and there'd be an exchange of ideas and much thought and philosophy, you know, and so we'd have lots of room for, even if it's not written in the music, lots of room for sort of ebb and flow within phrases. The piano was now um, 
a well established instrument and was very capable of great contrast so we've got the proficiency levels are now going to be well demonstrated on a, an instrument that can cope with these demands and um, you know the wind instruments had now got all of the mechanisms that would have helped us to play the the notes so for example comparing the flute of the romantic period to the flute, say, of the classical period, you know, there's much more that the flute can do now. I have an idea that at the time Mozart was composing, the note C on a flute, which is basically just one key held and the rest of it is just kind of a, a hollow tube, everything else is open, was a really, really awful note to play. In fact, I think it was often avoided because it just sounded so hard. It's a very difficult to note, note to play now, to play it beautifully because you're just blowing through an empty tube really. And so in the Romantic period, even if a piece of music doesn't suggest it on the piano, I would suggest you would obviously um, consider exploring pedaling and add pedaling even if it doesn't say you know I wouldn't over slushify it you know don't flood it with echo effects and pedal but there'd be lots of room for dynamic emotional contrast and storytelling the classical period was a reaction against the baroque period that it followed on from so the in the 1700s you know, they were a bit tired of all of this busyness and noise and they wanted to clean everything up and so classical music like you know your Mozart and your Haydn they wanted to find poise and grace and elegance so think about the classical columns in Greek architecture is it the Dorian Ionian columns where we've got you know everything sort of symmetrical with little twirly bits but you know symmetrical columns and it's clean and it's graceful and it's elegant and we've got much of the sort of question and answer phrasing balanced phrasing and so you would not be putting lots and lots of pedaling in it just would not be appropriate I think the piano was much more resonant at that time um, they wouldn't have and I don't think the the pedal was quite so established but it just wouldn't be appropriate to have lots of sustain and echoey slushy effects you know we, we, we're looking at delicacy history as well I find that we learn it in very boxed compartments so we we do a bit of art history and we do a bit of musical history and we do a bit of literature in historical context but we never quite sort of overlay the timelines together do we and I think if we can try and put things in context it really helps us feel the atmosphere of the times and so I, I think Mozart is just a little bit before Jane Austen I think you know we're just a little bit before the Regency period I have an idea that's the time when Wesley was writing all of his hymns and so on you know we've got the, the the little wigs with the little ponytails at the back sort of thing uh, you know the the tailed coats and the buckled shoes um, whereas perhaps in the overlapping period say from Beethoven moving from classical into romantic that's the time of the Napoleonic Wars and when you consider the um, the kind of the brooding nature of Beethoven's music at times it, you, it's no wonder if there's cannonballs going off in the background um, and uh, and um, that was the time that Constable and Turner were painting and that was the time when the Corn Laws were being um, debated and there was lots of strife in the land where you know businesses were failing because of these corn laws and this long war was really sort of strangling the nation and that was the time as well I think as I said I'm no historian when um, the the frame breakers the, the Luddites were um, reacting against the machinery that was taking away the jobs from the mills and if you've read the novel Shirley I absolutely love that book that tells us what was going on sort of generally speaking in the land and I think if we can just enjoy 
the setting and the history of the pieces that we're playing and placing them in line, we get such a rich understanding of the music that we're playing and hopefully that will give us a little bit more to enjoy and to give into the performance and to deepen our understanding and our enjoyment of playing the piece. And I just think it's really fascinating to just step into history as we play these pieces and just get a taste of what the world was like at that time. I hope that's helpful to you. Thanks for listening. Bye.